He's authored 12 book chapters, one, uh, one book and three edited volumes. Uh, Dr. Spencer will work links to our developmental science group, to cognitive uh, science here, behavioral neuroscience, um, and uh, the forthcoming Institute for Cognitive Sciences, the Neuroscience and Behavior Program, the New Neural Imaging Facility, the Emerging Early Childhood Focus Group, and the Center for Research on Families in the College of uh, Computer Science. So I'm very excited um, that he's here to talk to us today, and his talk is entitled The Emergent Executive Exploring the Neural Bases of uh, the Development of Cognitive Control. Um, so please join me in welcoming Dr. Spencer. You good? Sure. Good? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, thanks for the very nice intro. Um, today I'm going to give you an overview of one line of uh, research in my lab, uh, looking at the, uh, the development of executive function. Um, just to let you know, if you have questions during the talk, feel free to interrupt if something isn't clear or whatever. Okay. So to be successful learners, children must acquire a complex set of skills known as executive functions. Uh, this is nicely highlighted in a uh, recent uh, paper by Diamond and Lee in Science. To quote from, uh, from the article, to be successful takes creativity, flexibility, self-control, and discipline. Central to all those are executive functions, including mentally playing with ideas, giving a considered rather than an impulsive response, and staying focused. A wealth of data back up uh, this claim. So executive functions are more predictive of school readiness than IQ, and executive functions predict math reading competence throughout the school years. Uh, executive functions remain critical throughout life, predicting career and marriage satisfaction, and positive mental and physical health. Reversely, children 3 to 11 years with poor executive functions have worse health, earn less, and commit more crimes uh, 30 years later than those with better executive functions. All right, so what is executive function? Uh, typically, people conceptualize executive function as consisting of three components, uh, inhibition, working memory, and task switching. Uh, and the multi-component nature of executive function, I think, raises some critical theoretical challenges. First, we have to understand how those components interact. Uh, given the wealth of data on executive function at the level of the brain, we also have to understand how those components interact at the neural and behavioral levels. We've also got to understand these interactions across multiple time scales. So executive function is something that happens in real time as people behave, as they learn in context, and there are critical changes in executive function over development. And I think that last bit is particularly challenging theoretically because what happens in development is children create something qualitatively new, which is behavioral control and flexibility, that wasn't there before. To give you a better sense of executive function in the wild, I'll turn to one of my favorite examples, which is soccer. Um, so like many parents, I, I coached my kids' soccer teams. Uh, particularly when they were young. Uh, they, I've, I've been out class now as my kids get older. Um, but when you think about uh, kids engaging in soccer and how they do this clumping behavior and follow the ball, right, you can see there's a lot of uh, need for executive function. Uh, so they have to learn some inhibitory control, don't just follow the ball. You'll see this child just threw in on the other side of the, uh, the end line there. Um, so positioning where they are in space. They have to remember uh, different routines right, trying to score a goal versus doing a throw in, and they have to switch back and forth between these different routines. Now the other thing I like about the soccer example is it highlights something that isn't often e es uh, emphasized with executive function, something called autonomous action. Um, when you think about theories of executive function, uh, they have to be grounded in the real-time stream of behaving, because executive function is something you use in the real world, right, as you autonomously behave in context. Now, is this action really that hard? Um, let me give you a sense of, uh, yes it is. So this is a, a competition that happens every year um, called RoboCup, um, where uh, um, a bunch of people get together. These are all uh, uh, autonomous robots, so no one's behind the scenes with the joystick controlling their behavior. These robots are all organizing their own behavior in real time. 
Um, and what you see is they're awful, right? So the typical three-year-old would run circles around these, these robots. Okay? So this highlights that this autonomous action piece is a really important part to consider when you think about the development of executive function. Um, and as one YouTube uh, viewer noted, based on this, I guess we don't have to worry about the machines taking over anytime soon. <laughs> okay, today I'm going to talk to you about um, a, a new theoretical approach to executive function using the concepts of dynamic field theory. Uh, DFT is a theoretical approach to studying neural population dynamics in the brain, basically how groups of neurons work together to think and act. And this is a, a really nicely situated tool to bring to the executive function table. Um, we've done a lot of work looking at different components of executive function. Um, so a lot of work on the development of inhibition uh, in the context, for, for example, the Piaget may not be error. Uh, we've done a decade of work on the development of working memory, looking at things like changes in working memory capacity. Uh, and my colleagues in Bochum, Germany, have done a lot of work uh, on the autonomous action piece uh, using uh, autonomous robots to, to look at the organization of behavior in real time and context. So today what I'm going to do is, is uh, talk about um, a new theory of the development of the executive function, uh, focusing on, in on a particular task, the dimensional change card sort task. Uh, so this is a, a widely used task to study the early development of executive function. Uh, in this task, children are sor uh, shown uh, sorting trays like this. Uh, and we might say, uh, we're going to pl uh, play the color game now. And in the color game, blue things go here and red things go here. We'd then give the child a uh, card to sort, like this card, uh, and hopefully they would put it over here. Uh, we'd then give them another card, like this one, and hopefully they would put it over here. After doing several trials in a row of playing the color game, we tell them, okay, now we're going to switch games. Now we're going to play the shape game. In the shape game, circles go here and stars go here. What we find in this task typically is that three-year-olds will robustly perseverate. They will continue sorting the cards based on color, while four-year-olds uh, are able to switch rules. So they're able to actually switch and now start sorting the cards based on shape. This task is particularly interesting uh, for developmentalists because there's a dramatic shift in development over a relatively short period. So between three and five, uh, we see dramatic shifts in this task. Um, the task is also interesting because it requires integrating inhibition, working memory, and task switching processes. Right? You've got to be able to inhibit uh, sorting by one rule. You've got to remember in working memory the, the new goal of sorting by shape. Right? And you also have to organize all your behavior to switch from one rule set to another. Uh, it's also an interesting task because there's been a recent study using near-infrared spectroscopy that shed light on the neural systems involved in executive function very early in development. So that's an exciting advantage for the field as well. Okay, if we look at um, this task uh, and what explains performance in this task, a couple of theories that have been proposed. Um, Zalazzo and his colleagues have, have proposed uh, cognitive complexity control theory. Basic idea is, is to succeed in this task, children must construct a hierarchical rule structure that integrates the rules for the different dimensions and then reflect on those rules during that post-switch phase when we say, now we're going to sort by the shape dimension. One strength of, of CCC theory is that it explains many findings from the literature, um, but a downside is uh, this is basically a verbal theory. Okay, it's an information processing theory about how children construct if-then statements, but we have really no idea how they do that. Right? How do kids actually form the, that rule structure? And uh, it doesn't integrate with um, some of the, the recent data coming out on, let's say, the role of the frontal cortex in, in the formation of, of rules. An alternative theory that's been proposed is a parallel distributed processing model by Morton and Mutakata. The idea here is to succeed in the DCCS task, a prefrontal system has to actively represent the appropriate rules and overcome latent connections established during the pre-switch phase to sort by color. Now, the strength of this is it's a formal mathematical theory. Um, it has done uh, interfaced with neural data to some extent, but it doesn't have quite the coverage of the, the literature that CCC theory has. So our goal um, when uh, approaching executive function from the perspective of dynamic field theory was to really try to bring these two strengths together. We want to say, could we explain a broad range of findings like CCC theory, but use a formal, neurally grounded approach? So in the remainder of my talk, what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you about our, our theory of executive function, give you an overview of that. 
Then I'll move to the behavioral level, talk about um, simulations of children's behavior from a variety of DCCS tasks, uh, and then some tests of novel behavioral predictions. I'll then move to the neural level and how we've been exploring uh, this theoretical perspective uh, at that level of analysis. And then in the last part of my talk, I'll, I'll tell you about a couple uh, current extensions of this work in my lab. Okay, the starting point of our, uh, our dynamic field theory is a recent um, model of uh, object working memory that uh, my colleagues and I proposed uh, that captures the early development of uh, inhibitory and working memory processes. Uh, the first component in the model is shown here uh, over on the right. Uh, this is a uh, cortical field uh, with neurons that uh, have receptive fields to uh, spatial information. Okay, so along the x-axis is our spatial dimension. Along the y-axis is the activity of each neuron. Okay, so these two little bumps basically represent that there's something interesting over there on the left, okay, this object, and something interesting over there on the right, this object. Uh, and the properties of this cortical field mimic properties that have been found in uh, dorsal stream cortical areas, including the parietal cortex. Second component of the model is shown here. This is um, uh, now what we call a two-dimensional neural field. Uh, cells in, in this uh, neural field are bimodal, so they're sensitive to two types of information. Uh, they're sensitive to spatial information uh, and the color uh, uh, or feature, the, the, the color of an object. So uh, now activation is going to be represented by the color uh, scheme. Uh, so this would be a little hot spot of activity uh, representing the, the, the blue hue value over there on the left. And this little hot spot represents uh, that there's a, a red hue value over there on the right. Um, the properties of this cortical field mimic properties in the ventral pathway, including uh, ventral occipital cortex. Third component of the model is a, a second um, two-dimensional neural field. Uh, again, uh, cells in this field are, are, have, are tuned to two types of information, spatial information and now uh, a shape dimension. So this little hot spot uh, is saying I'm, I'm looking at a color over there on the left and the, the star shape over there on the right. And that mimics properties of uh, a, a different neural population in the ventral stream, um, the lateral occipital complex. Okay, the next uh, uh, issue here is uh, we've got these three neural populations. We need to understand how they talk to each other or how they're coupled to each other. And the way this model works is uh, the model passes information back and forth along that shared spatial dimension. So it binds features by virtue of their shared position in space. Okay? So as uh, activation, one of these um, fields um, goes above uh, the zero threshold level, you'll start to see activation passing back and forth along that spatial dimension. And uh, concretely, that will be these little vertical ridges of activity passed back and forth. OK, the last component of the model is a, a frontal system. Uh, we've got two populations that implement dimensional tension. Uh, this is basically a competitive system that can globally modulate or boost particular features. Clip does not want to study. Ah. Do you still have audio? <laughs> okay, great. So we have a, a color node here, a color, color population. Um, you can see uh, that uh, self excitatory population. And uh, between the two nodes here, the color node and the shape node, we've got uh, winner take all competition. Um, when one of these neural populations become active, uh, it passes activation to um, the, the color field over here, uh, basically raising the baseline level of activation in this neural population. Um, it also passes weak activation to the shape dimension. Reversely, the shape dimension passes stronger activation here to the shape field and weak activation to the color field. All right, so that's the architecture of the model. How does this model actually uh, sort cards in the DCCS test? Okay, the starting point for the model, um, we, we tell it to play the color game. The way we do that is we give a little bit of a boost to the color node here. Um, and that's our implementation of that, uh, those instructions. Uh, next, we're going to present a, a card to the model. I'll show you what that looks like. All right, whoops, let me pause that here. The model works a little faster than I do, so. Okay, so we present a card to the model, and the way we do that is we present uh, these ridges of activation across space, and basically our interpretation of that is the model's job is to take these features that are on the card and figure out where they should go in space, because at the end of the day, this is a sorting task. I have to sort the cards to the left or to the right. 
Okay, so we present the blue hue value here and the star feature here. And the model's uh, task is to say, where should I sort that card? Okay. Now, you can see that uh, there's a little bit of activation growing here at the blue value. The model kind of wants to put that over there on the left because there's blue over there to the left. You can see a little bit of activation growing here at the, uh, the star value. The model kind of wants to put that to the right because there's a star feature over to the right. Okay, as I play that, the rest of that simulation, what you're going to see is the model decides to put the card to the left. And the reason why the, the color field wins the day here is because of the little extra boost it gets from essentially being told to play the color game. Okay. So what the model does is it, it decides to put the blue thing to the left. This uh, star feature comes along for the ride. Right? And this is our implementation of a bound integrated object in dynamic field theory. So is the, this input layer, is it concurrently getting inputs from the two stacks of cards and also from the new stimulus? Is that what's going on? Yep, it's getting, yep, it's seeing these feature values in the task space, so it's getting that perceptual input. Yeah. Getting the pe perceptual input associated with the card, right? And it's getting essentially an instructed input at the level of uh, the dimensional attention system. Okay. Those inputs are converging, and then the model has to make a decision based. Okay, so in this case, the model decides to sort the blue star to the left. Okay, we can also give it a second type of card, typically used in this task, like the red circle. Uh, the model then uh, resets itself. And what you can see is I'm going to bring in the red feature value and the circle feature value. Uh, and again, the model makes a decision, and now in this case, sorts the red circle to the right. Okay, the last piece of the model I need to tell you about is uh, another component that's sort of going on underneath the hood in this model, which is a, a memory trace mechanism. So whenever it builds a peak in any one of these fields, it leaves a little memory trace, okay, a localized memory trace wherever that peak was, and that can bias processing in the model uh, on subsequent trials. Okay, so if I sort on one trial, I might have a slight bias to sort the red thing to the left on subsequent trials. Okay? You can see that uh, in, the, in this particular uh, freeze frame. This is the model after it sorted a bunch of cards in the pre-switch phase. Okay, and what you can see is it's got these two hot spots of activity uh, in the color field. Um, that reflects the, it's seeing a blue thing over there on the left. And it's also remembering I sorted blue things to the left on the previous trials. It's seeing a red thing in the task space on the right. And it's also remembering I've sorted red things to the right on subsequent trials. So that's a cooperative state in this, in this field. We've got a competitive state in this field. Okay, it's actually seen a circle feature over there on the left, but on previous trials it sorted circles, um, it, started, it sorted stars to the left location. And it's seen a star in the task space on the right, but on previous trials it sorted circles uh, to that location uh, in the switch phase. So we've got this competitive state going into the post-switch phase in that, in that shape field. Okay, in the, uh, in the DCCS task, the next step is to change the rules. Okay. We do that in the model very simply. We now give a boost to the shape uh, node to tell it to play the shape game. We give it a bunch of cards to start. And when I tell you, and I'll show you in a minute, um, the young model perseverates. Okay. And the reason the young model perseverates um, is that the boost to the shape node and its subsequent boost to this field is not sufficient to overcome the competition. Okay, so the model perseverates because there's competition on the shape dimension, and this cooperation essentially says, do what you did before. All right. Development in this model um, uh, is implemented by first, um, stronger excitatory and inhibitory interactions in this uh, dimensional attention system. Okay, so we boost the strength of excitatory and inhibitory interactions. Uh, and then the second thing we do developmentally is we essentially clean up the mapping between this frontal system and this posterior system. Okay, what that means is the shape node passes a little bit more activity to the shape dimension and less to color. And the color node passes a little bit more activity to the color dimension and less to shape. So essentially the model starts to learn what color, the word color means and what the word shape means. Okay. So let me show you some quantitative simulations of this model performing in the task. Um, so first, these are uh, uh, simulations of the standard DCCS task. So for example, uh, in the pre-switch phase, we ask kids to sort by color, and then we switch and ask them to sort by shape. 
Um, the red bars show data from the literature. You can see three-year-olds um, uh, do pretty poorly in this task. They only switch about 25% uh, of the trials in the post-switch phase. Four-year-olds do quite well. They, they switch correctly in the post-switch phase about 80% of the time. The blue bars show the model performance. Uh, you can see the model mimics the young children's performance um, quite well. Uh, and in particular, the three-year-old model perseverates again because of that competition in that shape field that it can't overcome with a weak boost from the from the, the, from the tension. Okay, now importantly, we, we can uh, um, run the model on lots of different variants of this task. Um, so I'll show you just a couple highlights to give you a sense of how the model works. Um, here's one version for, uh, of the task from the literature, and this version asked an important question. Uh, is it, uh, are children, young children having particular trouble in this task because we maintain the color values in that standard, standard version? Okay. So what uh, um, Zalazo and also Mueller did uh, in this negative priming version is children were sorting by color here and then they switched and sorted by shape. But what we did is we changed the color values. And the question is would that help young kids succeed? Okay. And you can see uh, three-year-olds still perseverate robustly in this task. They, they have a very low percentage of switching in the post-switch phase. Four-year-olds do quite well. Um, and you can see the model mimics uh, the performance uh, quite well. Uh, the reason the mo young model still perseverates is even though we got rid of the cooperation in that color field by changing the color values, we still have the competition in that shape field. So the, the we, again, the weak boost to that shape node isn't sufficient for the model to switch for. Uh, this is another interesting condition from the literature where they sort of did the reverse. So instead of changing the shape, the, the color values, they changed the shape values to see if maybe that would help young children perform better. You can see three-year-olds do a little bit better, but they still are at chance levels in this version of the task. Uh, the model, model mimics that performance. And we can see here why. Um, in the model, we actually got rid of that co uh, competition in the shape field. That's a good thing, but we still have the cooperation in the color field. Okay, so again, the model has this bias to want to sort by color, uh, and it still has a hard time. Now, one of the nice things about this model is that it not only explains why three-year-olds are so miserable, it also explains a couple ver versions of the task where they actually succeed. Okay, so it turns out if I change both the color values and the shape values during the post-switch phase, three-year-olds uh, now are able to switch rules. Okay? The model similarly to, has a, shows a boost in its performance. And if we look at the, uh, the simulation I have here, you can see why. Essentially, in this total change version, we get rid of the competition in the, the shape field. We also get rid of the cooperation in the color field. And under these conditions, even that small boost of the, the shape node is sufficient for the model to succeed at above chance levels. And here's a second variant where three-year-olds have been sh shown to succeed. Um, here, children sort no conflict cards during the pre-switch phase, so blue circle to blue circle, red star to red star. And then we introduce the standard conflict cards in the post-switch phase. And you can see three-year-olds do quite well. The model also does quite well. And the reason here is kind of the reverse of the just previous version. Now we've got uh, cooperation in both the shape field and the color field. Right, and so now again, a small boost to that shape node is sufficient for the model to, to show this uh, rule switching behavior. Yeah. So, you know, the percent for the model, I think, is the pathway. Yeah. Is that the case as well for the children? So, I know there's probably only one trial of this, but do the ones who get it right get it? Yeah. Or yeah. Get yeah. It? And it's an excellent question. Actually, there's a lot of uh, structure in the data, a lot more than you might think. So, um, and this was a real challenge for our, our, our model. So kids in this task typically, typically are all or none. Okay? So if they're going to perseverate, well, so the first criterion for keeping a kid in this task, they have to sort correctly in the pre-switch phase. And most kids do that on five of six trials. Okay? So that means our model has to sort correctly on five of five out of six trials as well, at the same percentage as kids. And then in the post-switch phase, kids are, as I said, typically all or none. So some kids will uh, actually switch on all trials, and when they perseverate, they, they perseverate on all trials. 
And um, that's actually a thorny problem for theory because uh, that actually shows essentially a learning process that's very fast, right? Uh, you, you basically got to, on the pre-switch phase, for example, learn in a single trial and keep doing that rule robustly. And if you have too much noise in your system, you're going to, you know, maybe get the right proportion correct, but not the right distribution. All right. So we, we're very attentive to those uh, empirical details when we're developing this theory. And I can tell you, the model does a really nice job of capturing that. Um, so actually, here's the quantitative summary of, of what the model achieves. So uh, overall, we simulated results in different conditions of this task. Uh, using the same model with the same parameters. Uh, overall, there are 37 data points, and we ran 57,000 total simulated responses, and the model did quite well. So within 6% of the empirical values uh, across the board. Okay, now we were very excited about these results, um, and that achieved sort of our first goal, which was that broad coverage of the literature, right, with a neurally grounded model that was mathematically specified, yada, yada, yada. But the, the goal areas to generate novel predictions. So I'd like to get into that next. Questions? Yeah. How many parameters? How many parameters is a great question, and maybe we can come back to that at the end. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a uh, complicated issue with a neural model. Um, and so maybe we can, I'm going to kick that one to the end, if that's okay. Okay. Um, so to, to talk about uh, some novel predictions that this, um, this theory makes, um, essentially, what, one of the things we focused on was uh, a unique feature of this model was how it binds objects or features together um, by virtue of, of space. Okay, and that was, that's not something that's been talked about much in the yes literature. Um, so we turned to this uh, negative timing version, which I told you about earlier, where we switched the color values in that post-switch phase. And we played around the model and realized something interesting, which is if we just do a simple manipulation, Okay, so I'll kind of flip back and forth so you can see this. All I'm doing is I'm switching where those target cards are in the task space, in that phase. Okay, watch the consequences here in, in the model. So here we've got competition in the shape field, and if I just switch where the target cards are in the task space, now I've got cooperation. So the prediction here is that if we just switch where the target cards are in the task space in the post-switch phase, three-year-olds should succeed. Okay, here are the data, and the answer is yes. Otherwise, I wouldn't be telling you about it. Um, so the red bars are, are replication of uh, this negative priming version. I'm showing you the number of children um, who pass and fail, and you can see in that negative priming version, the majority of three-year-olds fail in that version, and that replicates data from the literature. Um, and if we just do that single manipulation of swapping where the target cards are, now you can see we flip the distribution. So now the majority of three-year-olds are passing. Um, so this tells us that conflict about what is where in the task matters. Uh, and this was really exciting because no other theory of the DCCS task explains these, explains these data. Essentially, all the other theories were about the rule structure, the feature values, etc. And all that is the same, right? The features are the same. The rules are the same. Everything's the same except just where those target cards are in space. Okay. We realized, though, we could, we could do uh, one better. Um, if we look at the literature, um, three-year-olds actually succeed in this variant of the task. So if we have them sort these no-conflict cards here, and then we switch the color values, three-year-olds typically succeed. Uh, here's the model simulations of that, and the reason three-year-olds succeed is because we've got that cooperation in the shape field going into that post-switch phase. Okay? And if we do the same little ball game, I'm just going to switch where the target cards are. Now we go from cooperation to competition. And the prediction was that three-year-olds should now have trouble in this task. Okay, here are the data. Again, the red bars show our replication of the, the data from the literature. You can see the majority of three-year-olds are passing. Okay, and now when we do the space swap manipulation, now uh, three-year-olds go to chance levels. Okay, so uh, we felt very good about this because the, the model predicted both how to make and break children's performance. Okay, so I gave you an overview of our theory uh, and then showed you some uh, simulation work uh, showing that this theory has broad coverage of data from the literature uh, and also some successful tests of novel predictions. Uh, now I'm going to move to a uh, next question, which is, uh, can this theory bridge the gap between brain and behavior? 
All right, there's been actually a long history of looking at um, the neural bases of executive function. So all the data from fMRI studies with older children and adults shows that a distributed neural network underlies executive function. Um, that includes uh, key areas of the prefrontal cortex, parietal cortex, and temporal cortex. Um, and a key question is, what about early development? Um, well, there's a, a real barrier there because fMRI is not a suitable tool to use with three and four-year-olds. Um, it's loud and children have to lie perfectly still. And if you've ever tried to get a three-year-old to lie perfectly still, you know that's pretty much impossible. Although there's a few brave fMRI people I've seen who have tried to go as young as three. An alternative option is to use uh, functional near-infrared spectroscopy. Uh, so FNIRS is like fMRI in that it um, provides a measure of brain hemodynamics. Uh, Spatial resolution than fMRI. Uh, most critically, it only measures um, a few centimeters down into the, the cortical surface. Um, fortunately, a lot of cognition happens in that few centimeters of the cortical surface. Um, it's got better uh, temporal resolution from, than fMRI, uh, but we're still measuring slow hemodynamic response. Um, most critically, for our, our purposes, it can be used with young kids. Um, relative to other modalities, um, people typically talk about it's got better spatial resolution uh, than EEG or ERP. Okay, how does uh, NEARS work? Uh, NEARS takes advantage of the fact that skin, tissue, and bone are mostly transparent to near infrared light, um, while oxyhemoglobin and deoxyhemoglobin are strong absorbers of near infrared light. Uh, more differential absorption at different wavelengths, which is shown here. 